three. We'll talk about Bioshock 2 in a minute, but if you bear with me, I want to draw your attention to this phrase. He's been drinking the Kool-Aid. Where does it come from? What does it mean? I've got my entire life assuming it translates as believing a bunch of lies. Kool-Aid's sweet, so if you're drinking it, you're just being fed something easy. You're being told what you want to hear. Well, you know what they say about assumptions, it makes you a right cut. Turns out, drinking the Kool-Aid has a more sinister, more sick, more twisted etymology. It stems from a cult, the People's Temple, led by the charismatic Jim Jones, seen here sweating like rotting meat. You might know the story I'm about to tell you as the Jones Town Massacre. Jim Jones is a preacher, faith healer, con artist who believes in collectivism. The definition's in the name here. The collective or group must always take priority over the individual. He preaches that every act we make should be in the interests of other people, not ourselves. This is a stark contrast to Ayn Rand's objectivism, where selfishness is looked at as a virtue. The year is 1978. Jones has led over 900 people out of California and into his very own commune in South America. They call it Jonestown, seeking refuge because they believe a nuclear holocaust is imminent and that the United States government are after them because Jones claims to be a socialist. On a calm November morning, US Congressman Leo Ryan is visiting Jones in the People's Temple after allegations of abuse and murder. Congressman Ryan is shot and killed. Jim Jones panics and executes a failsafe called White Knight. His followers have been rehearsing this for months now, where they would come together and commit revolutionary suicide to avoid being taken in by, quote, the fascist American government. Jones holds the People's Temple at gunpoint and forces them to drink cyanide mixed with grape-flavoured Kool-Aid. Well, okay, that's not technically true. It wasn't actually Kool-Aid, it was flavoured. But ever since that fateful day, the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid has dripped into public consciousness, not just meaning to believe a bunch of lies, but to describe extreme dedication to a cause. And Sophia Lamb, uh, she is uh, partially inspired by uh, cult leaders like Jim Jones of the infamous Jonestown, uh, who was actually building a church mostly to promote communism. Where Bioshock 1 lampoons Ayn Rand's objectivism, Bioshock 2 is inspired by Jim Jones, the People's Temple, and collectivism. In fact, so much of this game is concerned with flipping the original Bioshock on its head and looking at the underbelly of the philosophies that crystallised it. If one was about the individual, two is about the collective. If one was about selfishness, two is about selflessness. If one was about capitalism, two is about socialism. Kind of. And that leads me to a quick disclaimer. This video, just like the game itself, is acting as a sequel to my critique of Bioshock 1. I'm going to be building off the stuff I talked about there rather than repeat myself by returning to old analyses. I do not recommend you watch this video if you haven't watched the other. Just like how I don't recommend you play Bioshock 2 without playing Bioshock 1 first. If you just lay the game out on paper, I feel the mightiest sense of whiplash. Jordan Thomas is the creative director, the lead designer on the Fort Frolic level from the original. Awesome, but the game was commissioned as a cash grab with bolted on multiplayer. Damn. The devs have doubled down on quality of life improvements. Awesome, but you're playing as a big daddy, the worst part of the first game. Damn. It promises to deconstruct collectivism in a pulpy way. Awesome, but that collectivism is coloured by a world created to rinse objectivism. Damn. One thing I think we can all agree on is that Bioshock 2 feels like a natural extension of the world and themes laid out for us in Bioshock 1. As a villain, Sophia Lamb feels like she's been ripped right out of an Ayn Rand novel. Brazen, cold, sociopathic in her understanding of selflessness and collectivism. Hey, they're adjectives you could actually use to describe Ayn Rand. But rather than just stop there, Jordan Thomas and his team fused Lamb's philosophies with Jim Jones's cult so we can see how a belief system so simple as, hey, maybe help other people, can be damaging and terrifying when taken to its extreme. So while we put Bioshock 2 under the magnifying glass, I will be looking at cults like the People's Temple as well to see what the game says about them. I don't know if returning to Rapture sticks the landing, but it makes for a hell of a video game. A game that asks, what happens when the dust has settled on Rapture? What happens when a group warped by hypercapitalism finds a new philosophy? What happens after they drink the Kool-Aid? This is a commentary, critique, and philosophical analysis of Bioshock 2. Look, Daddy, it's you. Let's go out to play, Daddy. 
Bioshock 2 expects you to have played Bioshock 1, and it offers no sympathy if this is your first venture into Rapture. Its first couple of hours give no real indication as to what it was built for, who its founder Andrew Ryan was, or what happened to him. Atlas is only mentioned in passing. Ryan's propaganda has been torn down and replaced. The Civil War is background noise to the suffering of the city's people. I don't say any of that as a criticism. Bioshock 2 has been made for fans of the first game, and expects you to at least vaguely remember Rapture's history so it doesn't waste time retreading old ground. It's got new stuff it wants to discuss with you. If you want to talk about objectivism, the first game's right there. We're suited and debuted as a big daddy this time. Subject, Delta. It's 1950 two years before Jack raised a little hell and killed Andrew Ryan. Rapture is beginning to crumble, but its denizens are still doing what they do best, partying it up. The first game leans into a slow, glorious build-up before we see the carnage unfold, but the sequel waits barely 60 seconds before we penetrate a splicer with our massive drill. Giggity. The whole game is awash with rot and deterioration. We'll look at how the levels showcase this later, but even here in our opening seconds, during the height of Rapture's decadence, we see that it's starting to leak. We see the gloom. We see our little sister Eleanor harvest Adam from a corpse. There we are. He's perfectly safe now. This is not your daughter. Do you understand? Her name is Eleanor. And she is mine. Our cultish parallels already come fast and thick with Sophia Lamb's powerful introduction. She speaks to Delta while he's hypnotized, brainwashed by a plasmid. Her status as a demagogue is shown by how this scene, this moment, makes her seem like Andrew Ryan. Just like how Ryan ordered Jack to sit like a good dog in the first game, Lamb puts Delta on his knees before handing him a gun and forcing him to shoot himself. It's one hell of a roller coaster to carry the player through, and we haven't even picked up a controller yet. When we awaken ten years later, brought back to life through a Vita chamber, we have a very clear understanding of what our goals are. Find Lamb, rescue Eleanor. The similarities between the two openings continue throughout the game, but here, in the Adonis Luxury Resort, Jordan Thomas and his team are po-faced about reminding us of Bioshock 1. Sophia Lamb locks us in a cage and unleashes splicers on us, just like Ryan did. Our first plasmid is offered up to us for free as a gift, indicated by the recognisable neon sign. Bridget Tenenbaum appears on the radio to guide us, just like Atlas did. The difference here is that there's less work put into making us trust Tenenbaum because most players will know who she is. She was a trusted partner by the end of the first game, so the sequel doesn't need to worry about giving us a reason to follow her. The pulpy bluntness of Irrational's messaging is here too. Just a few feet in front of us, painted on the wall, is the phrase Fallen. Fallen is Babylon. The obvious religious connotations aside, this is a phrase ripped right out of Jim Jones's playbook. He would regularly refer to Babylon in his sermons, portraying American capitalism as such. Quote, They say America's heavenly. America's not heavenly. America's hell. You think God looks to America and sees Eden? Nah, God looks to America and sees Babylon. And just like the book says, Babylon will fall. You'll see. Just you wait. You'll see. Andrew Ryan designed Rapture to be the greatest representation of his own American ideals. Hypercapitalist, free from gods or kings, and it's clear that Lamb's cult has embraced the fall of Rapture. They're trying to rebuild the city in a new vision, free of individual identity. Daddy was sleeping for such a long time, and Eleanor has missed you. Find her and you'll be all better. The design of the little sisters has changed, more human than before. The eyes are still glowing and dead, true, but their proportions are less bulbous and bloated. They've not got the big dumb melon heads anymore, making them seem a little bit older and less alienating. It's clearly to make us sympathise with them even more, after all this is just one of many angry dad simulators that pervade modern games, but there's in-game logic for this change too. Later, when we find Tenenbaum, she explains that the little sisters wandering Rapture now are not the same ones she created. In the canon of Bioshock 2, Jack got the good ending to his story. He rescued all of the sisters and took them to the surface. But Lamb has been sending her people topside to kidnap children and bring them back to Rapture, so they can keep making little sisters. The reason why she's doing this is a mystery for now, but our whole time in the Adonis Resort is committed to building up Lamb as a force to be reckoned with. 
Graffiti sprays the walls, telling us she's always watching. We see posters of her, dead butterflies mashed around a grim face. Copies of her book, Unity and Metamorphosis, litter the hallways. Every second audio recording we find is of her and her utopian vision. In a game with nine levels, Lamb dominates over half of them. You shall be raised as I was, to advance the common good through social psychiatry. This city's potential is immeasurable, Eleanor. Yet our beliefs are unwelcome here. Life will be difficult, but the price of revolution is always dear. So let's talk Sophia Lamb. She's an amalgamation of a whole host of real-life people, not just Jim Jones. In a 2009 interview with Game Informer, Jordan Thomas said, quote, Lamb is based on a suite of utilitarian and altruistic philosophers that I've always found interesting. Her background is based in part on that of John Stuart Mill. He was isolated from other children, specifically because his father wanted to groom a genius-level intellect to promote his philosophy. That had some real consequences for him. For Sophia Lamb, it's turned her villainous. The reason why John Stuart Mill might ring a bell is because he's the philosopher who said that all evil needs to triumph is for good people to do nothing, a quote wrongly attributed to Edmund Burke by John F. Kennedy. Thanks for that, John. Mill's isolation from other children is just like what Sophia Lamb does to her daughter Eleanor. She keeps her separated from everyone else so she wouldn't be influenced by the selfish gene she sees in her fellow Rapturians. Speaking of the selfish gene, there's a bastardized version of Richard Dawkins in Lamb as well. Dawkins argued that every living being has inside of us a selfish gene that informs our evolution and that we need to overcome that gene if we're going to build a better world. Lamb, just like Dawkins, spent her life studying this gene and trying to find a way to overcome it. In ethical psychiatry, we must account for the role of evolution. Depression, fits of panic, sexual pathos, all responses to ancient selection pressure. The irony is that this theory is why Ryan's people invited me here. They mistake my study of natural law for the worship of competition. Remember, Eleanor, one must know the beast before it can be slain. It's one of the few things Sophia Lamb and Andrew Ryan agreed on. Ryan argued that all people are inherently selfish, and through the pursuit of that selfishness, we could build a utopia. It's why he built Rapture, to try and prove that theory. Of course, we all saw how that went. Lamb also believes that all people are inherently selfish, but that selfishness holds us back from building a utopia. She argues that it's our moral duty to reject the selfish gene, to fight against it at every opportunity. It's why we see this mantra painted on the halls of her corner of rapture. Lamb argues that the only way to do that, to reject selfishness, is to tear it out at the root and reject the self. Finally, of course, Lamb is like the preacher Jim Jones, in more ways than one. For a start, she was geographically fluid. Jones had a church in Ukiah, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and in the end, Guyana. He was always on the move, with fingers in many pies. This strengthened his grip on his cult, because they didn't have a foundation to settle into. The only constant in their lives was Jones. Sophia Lamb set up her psychiatrist's office in a variety of locations across Rapture. In the Adonis Resort, she offered therapy to the wealthy. In Persephone, she treated criminals. In Pauper's Drop, she offered her services to the poor. By the time we meet her, she's sociopathic, more invested in finding a way to eradicate the self than truly helping people. Initially, she was a member of the Rapture Council, brought in by Ryan to treat its people because they were slowly going insane due to a lack of sunlight. We learn this through the game's fantastic environmental storytelling as well as the audio recordings. One of the first adverts we see is for Sunbeam Gum, gum that promises to give you vitamin D. Purely due to how prevalent she is in this section, Bioshock 2's opening portrays Sophia Lamb as directly connected to how insane Rapture has become. Okay, I can't be alone in thinking that the big sister was Sophia Lamb or Eleanor, right? I feel a little insane saying this now, considering there are dozens of these things running around the game, but on my first blind playthrough, I thought it was set up for a clumsy twist. Originally, there was only going to be one. You'd fight her, but you'd never quite kill her until the very end. Irrational went back to the drawing board after they saw playtesters get frustrated every time she got away with just a little bit of health left. And while I think this changes for the better, 
it leaves a bit to be desired. In gameplay, the big sisters are an ominous, terrifying force. If we're playing as a big daddy, we still need something that's bigger and bolder than us, so we don't feel overpowered, and the big sisters fill that gap easily. But from a lore perspective, it feels like the game doesn't give them the attention they deserve because they had to be reworked so late into development. When you take a single character and split her into 20, that doesn't leave much room to really flesh out the lore of where she came from and what her purpose is. The game does give us this information, they are little sisters that Jack somehow didn't save, but that feels a little hand-wavy in the grand scheme of things. It's not a deal breaker, and whenever you hear their shrill screams heralding their appearance, it's hard not to get a little scared and a little pumped for your fight with one. However, their lack of honest, direct lore is a problem we'll see in other areas later in the game. But we will get there. For now, this big sister uses her gargantuan strength to flood Adonis. We're carried off into the ocean outside and forced to recalibrate our plan. In that suit, even the ocean cannot harm you. This is good. But rapture is the death of many great men. Alone, you will not last long. This short set piece is a rationals button to close off the game's opening. It reinforces a few things to us. The first is how dangerous this new rapture is. The big sisters are faster and stronger than we could ever hope to be, able to open up the city to the elements with just a few swipes of their blade. The second is how powerful we are as a big daddy. Not even the ocean can penetrate our suit. The third is how much rapture has deteriorated since Jack's adventure. If it was a mess before, it's rubble now. The memories of Ryan's utopia lost to the waves. The fourth, is all about Sophia Lamb. Everything we just talked about has been drip-fed to us while exploring the Adonis suite, mainly shown off by the environment and propaganda. Her authoritarianism has been hinted at, her portrayal as a cult leader and the fact she killed us at the start solidifies her as a villain, but we haven't heard anything tangible about how extreme she can be. All right, diary, last entry. Lizzie and I, we found a sphere, and we're going home. Ain't that right, baby? Next stop? Top side. <laughs> oh, I love you. It was you who saved us, Sammy. It was you, but... One optional audio log changes everything. Just like Jim Jones hoarding his people in Jonestown, she's trapped everyone down here. Nobody is allowed to leave. The bathospheres are deactivated, the big sisters patrol the ocean floor, and worst of all, anyone who's able to find a way out is blown to hell. It's rule number one when it comes to forming a cult. Keep your followers isolated. Don't let the outside world influence your hold over them. If somebody leaves, it could spark a chain reaction and make other members think they can leave as well. Jim Jones would threaten to kill anybody who left the People's Temple. He forced them to sign fake documents confessing to crimes they didn't commit so he could blackmail them into staying the sick little roach that he was. Sophia Lamb doesn't do anything so Machiavellian. She just blows defectors out of the water. She's ruthless, and we've barely skimmed the surface of what she's capable of. But before we go any further, this video is sponsored by friend of the channel, bestgameprice.net, a price comparison site that saves you money on PC games. It's totally free to use and connected to all the big gaming sites. Steam, Epic Games, Green Man Gaming, and so many more, I feel like I could burst. Through using the site, I can get Bioshock Infinite for a fiver. If I just relied on Steam, it'd be 60 quid for a nine-year-old game. Name a game and it'll probably be on there. It's got your standard AAAs, your indies, your DLC, you name it. There's no sign up needed, all you need to do is click the link in the description to start seeing where you can save money and help the channel out. Massive thanks again to bestgameprice.net and on with the video. Our second level, the Atlantic Express, is a bit of a nothing part of the game so we're not going to hang around here for very long. Tenenbaum is waiting inside for us and we've got to muster through the maintenance depot of Rapture's first means of transportation, an underwater train. The Depot is really here to get us up to speed on Rapture's whole vibe. The game only released two and a half years after the original, so the point is really to set up our primary means of getting around and give us the cliff notes of Bioshock 1's philosophy. The criticisms of Ayn Rand and objectivism are shown to us through the story of Prentice Mill, the man that invented Rapture's train. Me? No city without the Atlantic Express. Ryan took his first grand tour on my flagship coach. Days. Personal bathospheres are all the rage. My rails only connect the oldest parts of Rapture now. And the city's just... just left me behind. 
You might remember from the Bioshock 1 video that Ayn Rand really loved trains. Man, a personality trait she assigned to Dagny Taggart, the main character of Atlas Shrugged. Both Dagny and Rand just loved to ride him in more ways than one. Prentice was invited to Rapture as the city grew to create a railway that would always keep it moving. Public, clean transportation for the masses. What a legend. Ah, but this is Rapture. So, unfortunately, the city had other ideas. Bath's fears were invented a few years later faster, more private, more comfortable ways to travel, so Rapture's wealthiest flocked to them and left behind Prentice's railways. To reclaim his profits, Prentice started charging more, which meant that poor people who couldn't afford the bathospheres couldn't really afford the trains either, and the whole thing fell apart. It's a tiny anecdote, mercifully brief. I mean, really, who wants to hear about a train for two hours? Not you, Ein! But it gets the point across easily enough. Rapture, being a slave to hypercapitalism, left behind the great inventors like Prentice Mill because its population advanced so quickly. He had no safety net to fall back on, no form of welfare, and ultimately died in poverty like many of Rapture's gifted thinkers. The Atlantic Express reminds us clearly that Rapture was an environment that failed its people. The poor were looking for an alternative, so fell into Lamb's cult without a second thought. Gameplay-wise, this feels like an extended tutorial. The Express is decidedly linear as a level, desperate to make sure we don't miss any gameplay elements. We get our mitts on a few new weapons, pick up a couple of cool new plasmids, are introduced to some stronger combat challenges to amp up the pressure, and ultimately access the new and improved hacking system. So, while Delta marches on to meet with Tenenbaum, let's talk about our new gadgets. Let's brace ourselves for more mind-numbing hacking. Oh, this doesn't actually suck. Kind of. Hacking has improved, yes, I'd even call it pretty good, but it still carries my personal pet peeve from the first game. We are now armed with a remote hacking tool sitting patiently in our weapon wheel with three ammo types. Standard hacking darts, auto hacking darts, and little gun turrets that do as much damage as a spud shooter, so don't worry about them. Regularly, the game will position a control console just out of reach, but luckily angled near a broken window so we can shoot a dart at it and hack from a distance. And by regularly, I mean 200 times. Without variation, this is how you open locked doors in the game. And by the 200th time, you are crying out for some change in this formula. Maybe we need to use our drill to smash through some reinforced glass first. Or, I don't know, maybe there's a shutter that keeps blocking our way so we need to time it just right. No? No? Okay, fine, well, I'll take what I can get at this point. Everything that could be hacked in Bioshock 1 is still hackable in 2. Cameras, turrets, security bots, all are ripe to fight for you, and typically, the larger combat arenas have a plethora of these bad boys lying around so you can turn enemy territory into your territory. I love that hacking now has variables to consider. You can still jack into stuff up close, you can still spend money to buy them out instead, but the risk is much greater than converting a turret from far away. The fact that your darts are a finite resource you need to buy or loot means there's additional risk if you want to quickly hack something in the middle of battle, meaning planning and preparation become a serious factor during combat. The process itself has been completely overhauled, a decision so welcome that Irrational even incorporated it into their marketing strategy. There are a fair few interviews with Zach McClendon, the game's lead designer, talking about the changes, like here. The changes to hacking, um, that's definitely uh, was one of the longest discussions we had on, on the project uh, in terms of there were a lot of people who really loved the Bioshock 1 minigame, there are a lot of people who really hated the Bioshock minigame um, in the community and the fan base same kind of uh, kind of reception um, and it, it's really tricky because once you go down the minigame route it, it is wide open in terms of what you could do. It's faster, it's more free-flowing, it's more active than the original game, operating more like a quick time event than a drawn out puzzle. The world doesn't freeze around you so you open yourself up to damage while you tinker away and there are chances to increase the damage output of whatever you're hacking through the different coloured options. All of this is fan bloody tastic but Frustratingly, hacking still carries that big fat nitpick I highlighted in my last critique. Yes, the success screen. After a successful hack, an easy 75% of the screen will momentarily fill up with a message telling you, hooray, your hack went well. It's just one prompt this time, rather than the 50 from the original, but there's still no need for the prompt full stop. A nitpick, I know, but I wish there was a way to turn these off because they're counterintuitive to this new focus on fast-paced, in-action hacking. Now, here is what the children tell me. 
You are a very old Big Daddy, bonded for life to a single little one. When you are apart for too long, your body begins to shut down like a coma. As long as the girl is in the rapture, you are trapped here as well. Reaching Tenenbaum, she catches us up to speed. We are the original Big Daddy, bonded to Eleanor Lamb back in the day. Eleanor has been taken from us by Sophia, and she's now holed up near Fontaine Futuristics. What this means for the moral compatibility of Delta and Rapture is what's most interesting though, because we underwent one of the original bonding processes. Any time spent away from Eleanor weakens us. If we don't reunite with her, we'll eventually just shut down and die. I think there are three ways to read this, and honestly I'm not set on which one I prefer, so hear me out and drop a comment below to tell me what you think. I friggin love comments, give them to me. <laughs> Number one, Delta embodies pure selfishness. The only reason he's going to save Eleanor is to save himself. If he doesn't, he's going to die. Number two, Delta embodies pure selflessness. Because of his bond with Eleanor, he lives for her. His entire existence is now predicated on protecting someone else. And number three, Delta physically can't embody either one. This is probably my favourite, but I'm, I'm not sure. Delta doesn't remember who he used to be. Just like every other Big Daddy, he's on autopilot, roaming rapture without thought or expression. He's kind of a walking example of what Sophia Lamb is trying to achieve, whether she realises it or not. The Big Daddy process has eradicated Delta of the self. He doesn't think for himself, he doesn't have any intentions outside of get Eleanor, and because he's lacking in the self, he doesn't have the selfish gene that Lamb talks about. Everything he does, whether it's killing someone or saving them, is an amoral act because there's no intention behind it. He's not doing the right or wrong thing because those concepts are now alien to him. Of course, the third reading is where we get into really messy territory, because Delta does have a self, doesn't he? When I'm playing him, I am Delta's self. When you're playing him, you are. We give Delta's actions intention. We decide if someone should live or die, or if a little sister should be rescued or harvested. At what point in a game like this does a player define the morality of the mindless creature they're playing as? Citizens of Rapture. This is Subject Delta. Behind that mask hides an enemy of the people, without soul or sympathy. It is a beast apart, and as family, we must tear out its jaw and drive it back into the sea. Brain teasers aside, our eventual meeting with Tenenbaum doesn't turn out as we hoped. Just as our favourite mad scientist is about to lay out the plan, Sophia Lamb interrupts us and we're ambushed by splicers. We hold them off long enough for Tenenbaum to escape, but we're now separated. And this means we need to put our faith in a brand new face, Augustus Sinclair. It's apt that we partner up with Sinclair when we reach Ryan Amusements, because this whole section is a return to objectivism and Sinclair is a great example of an Ayn Rand hero. Thoughts about Sophia Lamb's cult of selflessness isn't the focus, instead we're returning to Ryan's cult of selfishness. Sinclair feels like a response to how objectivists criticised the first game, claiming that all of its hypercapitalist characters were just caricatures, not representing Ayn Rand's beliefs. Which is funny really, because every prominent billionaire looks like a cartoon character. Bioshock gives us a world where societal selfishness never helps people, it only hurts them. But Sinclair is a charismatic, selfish businessman that did a teensy little bit of good. I like to look a man in the eye when I give him my word. You and me, kid, we're going places. Unless you're the sort of person who'd let Ayn Rand fart on your face, nobody would really call Augustus Sinclair a good man. He was a selfish, spoiled businessman who built Rapture's prison, Persephone, and rented out the inmates for plasmid testing. His whole motivation across the game is to steal Rapture's secrets and get to the surface so he can sell them off for a pretty penny. To the player, he's similar to Atlas from the first game. Both are the firm voice in our ear, giving us our instructions and guiding us through Rapture. Both are sending us off to kill the new demagogue, not out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it will further their own goals. Sinclair is helping us kill Sophia Lamb because while she's alive he can't escape. He's purposefully positioned as incredibly untrustworthy purely due to his selfishness. But call me a shill, I've got a soft spot for Sinclair. He never betrays us right until the end. While he occasionally withholds information, he never lies. He has an incredibly grim and tragic death and every time he calls a sport or son, it's tough not to feel warm and fuzzy inside. 
Maybe that says more about me than it does the game. As for what he represents for objectivism, Sinclair's self-interest, his keenness to get rich, ended up helping the poverty-stricken peoples of Rapture. Then I met a straight shooter named Sinclair, and he laid a sweet deal on me. Says he's got some hard luck folks down at Popper's Drop can whip up this junk at half the cost I used to pay. Yeah, I had to pick a needle or two out of the shipments, but all in all, nobody's the wiser, and I'm all the richer. He made his profits by giving work to the poor residents of Popper's Drop. Sinclair would sell a box of unassembled syringe parts to the down and out residents in the drop, have them assemble the syringes, and buy back the finished product at twice the price. He built affordable housing for the poor because nobody else was. There was a gap in the market and he filled it, reaping the financial benefits that it afforded. None of this was selfless, all of it was to serve his own ends, but the result was the same, employment and shelter for those Andrew Ryan had left behind. As you can see, Chief, the station here is iced over. To reach Eleanor Lamb at Fontaine headquarters, we'll have to clear the way. Now, in order to melt that ice, you'll need a plasmid like a handful of hellfire. Our journey to Fontaine Futuristics is interrupted by a huge iceberg that blocks the way. In order to get rid of it, we need to explore Ryan Amusements to get our hands on an incinerate plasmid. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, wrong. The amusement park is split into three sections. The gift shop, journey to the surface, and the hall of the future. With one simple goal, find the incinerate plasmid, you'd think that the level design would take its hand off the steering wheel and let you explore Ryan amusements at your own leisure, just like Bioshock 1 would, but that's not necessarily the case. Bioshock level design is at its best when it gives you a little hub with branching rooms and spaces to explore, slowly uncovering pieces to form a whole. The medical pavilion in the first game is a perfect example of this. We see the surgeon's wing, a funeral home, a dental practice, all bite-sized chunks that combine to make each level feel like a crispy anthology held together by a soft, gooey middle. Bioshock 2's level design doesn't necessarily level up these concepts. In fact, I think it levels down. Bioshock 2's level design is also a step up from the first game. The overall themes of the districts aren't quite as striking. There's nothing here to rival Fort Frolic, for example. But the maps themselves are more complex, multi-layered, and spatially imaginative. These words are from the PC Gamer article, Bioshock 2 is one of the boldest sequels ever made, written by Andy Kelly. It's a take I've seen parroted numerous times when discussing the game and I can't help but disagree. I think everyone, myself included, got really excited because Jordan Thomas was the creative director and he's the mastermind behind Fort Frolic and Shalebridge Cradle from the Thief series. I feel very much alone in thinking that Bioshock 2 just doesn't show off Thomas's best work, not even close. The game gives you one overarching goal and then inhibits your progress with numerous invisible goals. For example, the end result of nabbing a plasmid involves getting a ticket to the amusement park, killing two big daddies, escorting their little sisters to Adam, escorting them to a vent, and then finding the plasmid. There's an acute sense that Irrational was terrified you'd miss stuff, treating Bioshock 1's open-ended design as something to cull rather than cultivate. There are no longer vents to creep through to reach secret rooms, no moment where you need to use telekinesis to get hold of a key. Optional spaces are here, but they're always hidden away behind a control panel to hack or a passcode to insert, and what you find on the other side is rarely worth it. Take the Little Sister Orphanage. There's one of these in Bioshock 1 where you can see Fontaine's selfish philosophy for yourself, learn what happened to Ryan's girlfriend Diane, and see Atlas's headquarters during the Civil War. All of this is an optional space you do not need to enter. Bioshock 2 has another orphanage, where Eleanor was kept before they turned her into a little sister. It is once again an entirely optional area, but it's just one empty reception room, a corridor, and a bedroom with an audio log. The optional stuff just isn't nearly as compelling, because anything interesting is stuck onto the main quest. The farmer tills the soil, trading the strength of his arm for a home and lands of his own. But the parasites say no. What was yours is ours. We are a state. We are gone. We demand our share. You can see the level designer's fingerprints around every corner, even if you're not looking for them. You're always being funneled. Let's take another example from later in the game, Popper's Drop. 
We need to get into King Pond to steal a research camera. The front door has a flimsy looking padlock on it. For some reason, the Big Daddy's massive drill won't break the padlock, so we need to get into Sophia Lamb's clinic, go the long way round, and drop into the pawn shop from the roof. Ah, but we can't get into Lamb's clinic without a passcode, so it's off to the Fishbowl Diner to find that before coming back. It feels a lot like parts of Bioshock 2 were set up to provide options to the player and how they navigate the space, but the development team forgot to go back and give us those options. We gain the ability to use our drill to smash down debris later on, but we only use this to open up a pathway once during a scripted section. There's a whole area called Skid Row that's locked off to us without explanation, only to randomly open up once we get the research camera. And that padlock from Popper's Drop is just one example of moments where it feels like the level designers want us to try something, but the game won't let us. There are doorways boarded up with planks of wood that are explicable. There are lighter shade than any other types of wood we see in the environment, and it looks like they stand out on purpose. But we can't drill through them or break them down with Drill Dash, which isn't just frustrating, but it loosens any feeling of being a big daddy. Back to the level in question, Ryan Amusements, there are dozens of doors marked staff only, sealed off to the player until you finish the level, and even once you unlock them, they just give you shortcuts and no secrets. All of this stuff is here to make Bioshock 2's Rapture feel bigger, trying to simulate a real city rather than smaller hubs like the original game gave us. This is great, but Irrational overcompensated for fear that the player wouldn't reach their objective, so they funnel you, making these wide, expansive, layered levels feel frustrating and linear. I was hired to engineer a park the likes of which no man has seen. Now all I do is watch over it like a grizzled sheepdog. My first line of mechanical puppets made the children here cool with wonder. But Ryan thought my vision was immature. Antiquated, he said. This place could have been something magical. But instead, he turned it into a school. No, a cathedral. Dedicated to himself. Ryan Amusements shows this off best. Once you reach the journey to the surface section, you follow a railway through various exhibits narrated by Andrew Ryan himself, ranting away about parasites and socialism and that goddamn welfare state that's just so bad because he says so, you know? Just because we're not talking about Sophia Lamb here doesn't mean the games stopped examining cults. Ryan Amusements is Andrew Ryan's chapel to himself. It's less a theme park and more a propaganda machine, explicitly designed that way to convince Raptor's children to never leave the city. While Jim Jones didn't build a theme park for the People's Temple, the thought process behind Ryan Amusements does kind of line up pretty closely with how Jones kept his members in line. When he wasn't forcing parents to blackmail themselves, Jones was carefully creating an enemy for the temple to focus their attention on. The American government and capitalism are the cause of all your woes, he would say. But did you know that there's an alternative they don't want you to know about? The power of Jim Jones didn't just come from the fake healing, or the threats, or the fact he used Christianity to bring in people open to blind faith. It came from preying on the ignorance of his followers. Socialism and communism were dirty words in the 70s. Hell, frustratingly, they still pretty much are, not just in America, but over here in the UK as well. Right-wing pundits use that labelling like it's the ultimate shutdown to left-wing ideas. Um, can we just get one thing nailed to the wall before yeah. we get going here? Uh, you've been accused severally in the last few weeks of being a Marxist. It happened again last night. Uh, a backbench Tory MP said you were a Marxist with no interest in anything other than trying to tear down the government. Now, are you or are you not a Marxist? Because if you are a Marxist, then you're into revolution and into bringing down capitalism. So, are you or aren't you? Jones taught his people about socialism and really pushed the idea that this philosophy was contraband. The government don't want you to talk about it, he'd say, conjuring the image of some forbidden fountain of knowledge that only his people could drink from if they paid their contributions to the temple. He'd turn that knowledge into brainwashing for children through eerie, creepy songs that they'd learn to sing. Ryan Amusements does this too, except it's through theatre and roller coasters, not song. The world of the surface is portrayed as terrifying and oppressive. We see Taxes Avenue and Parasite Road. Gigantic hands come out of the darkness and drag children off to war. Bye, Billy. Good luck in Nam. There's no free thought here. No free men like Ryan promises. Just propaganda that comes with an entry fee. Sound like someone we know? Returning to the game's level design, I do want to balance out my previous criticisms. I led with the stuff I don't like, but just like with all of Bioshock 2, there's improvements that can't be ignored as well. The first is the map. This is a tiny change from the original game, but because I ripped into Bioshock 1's map, I've got to give credit where it's due. 
Bioshock 2 tries to even out how muddled its map looks by eliminating which area you're on when you interact with it. It's still clumsy to navigate, but at least now you have a sense of which floor you're on. The objective marker, or compass, is used a lot less too. There are plenty of moments where the game just rips it away from you, so you're not mindlessly following a single path. Again, it's just a shame that the way the levels are structured overcompensates for this. Right there on Milikarak, there's a bottle of sacramental wine from my dear brother Simon. <laughs> and of course, the vintage date on the label is the code to enter his territory. 1919. The game has more puzzles as well, adopting a quantity over quality approach. There's a girth of audio diaries included to explicitly tell you the passcode for certain doors, which means these diaries are mechanical as well as story driven. Bioshock 1 did this as well, but the amount is easily doubled. Again, it's just a shame that there's less variety on how you handle your navigation. Passcodes, hacking consoles, or occasionally shooting electricity at broken panels are your only three obstacles. But there is one moment much later in the game that's some of the strongest puzzle design in the series. Towards the end, in Persephone, we need to break into a control room. It's the only time across Bioshock 1, 2, or Infinite that you get to choose how you progress. Figuring out the passcode requires a lengthy burrow through jail cells and detention halls. If you find a crack in the wall, you can find a hidden audio diary that gives you all four numbers needed. Alternatively, you can scavenge each number individually, split across other audio diaries, following the story of prisoners trying to work together to crack the code. Or, if you wished, you could do a bit of platforming and use the electric plasma to shoot open the door. Options, baby! It's hardly revolutionary, but it's a direction I'd love to see explored more if we ever get a Bioshock 4. As a series, Bioshock has always had one toe dipped into the immersive sim genre. Doubling down and giving the player a game world that incentivizes thinking outside the box would raise everyone's creativity levels, and I don't think it would detract from the storytelling if handled right. Collecting the incinerate plasmid, we're ushered back to the train and prepare for our next stop. We get to meet Sinclair in the flesh, up close and personal, but before we depart, I want to draw your attention to Nina Carnegie. Donnie, get down off that exhibit, and I told you, spit out that gum! You'll choke! <sighs> the kids' parents deserve a night off to enjoy New Year's, but I met my wits end. Donnie, I told you! Poor, dead Nina Carnegie was guiding children through Ryan amusements when the Civil War broke out. She was a glorified babysitter, and when the attacks happened and the theme park was sealed off, she was left alone to care for children that weren't hers. Over the course of three audio logs, we hear about how much she suffered to save these children. A selfless act, voluntary babysitting, led to another selfless act, starving so the children could eat, not abandoning them when it would have been all too easy. I think it's important to note Nina Carnegie here, because Bioshock 2 goes to deliberate lengths to show Lamb's cult as being pseudo-socialist and maniacally selfless, but there is an awareness that the core of Lamb's philosophy isn't the problem. Nobody would look at Nina's death and claim that her selflessness was immoral. Just like Jim Jones and his socialist commune, the figurehead is the issue here, not the philosophy itself. You must learn to play poker, Eleanor. Like anyone, I am flawed and have a fierce genetic bias towards competition. But each Saturday, I read the other players, and I pick a man who will benefit the most from victory. By the final hand, I ensure that he takes home my entire stake, and that of the others. I win nothing but the feeling of conquest over myself, and the wealth of my competitors is slowly reshuffled according to their needs. Sophia Lamb is a big, fat hypocrite. She's not truly invested in the type of collectivism she preaches, and if we were able to interrogate her lieutenants, we'd see a melting pot of beliefs and views that don't always marry up. Where Andrew Ryan strayed from his objectivist beliefs the day he seized Fontaine Futuristics, Sophia Lamb never believed the human race could create a utopia because we all carry a selfish gene that we can't overcome. But that didn't stop her preying on the masses at their lowest point. Popper's Drop is where we get to see this for ourselves. The Drop is where Rapture's purists lived out their days. It was a blind spot for Andrew Ryan because he simply didn't care about the unemployed. This made it right for Sophia Lamb to set up shop, offering free counselling and planting the seeds of socialism in people who had nowhere else to turn. And she started with Grace Holloway, who went on to become her closest confidant. He liked hearing songs about what it's really like to live in this town. I think he's been trying to organize folks against Ryan. And now he's gone. And I'm here. 
singing, rise, rapture, rise. Scared to death they're gonna come for me. As you can imagine from a 1950s capitalist state, there weren't many successful black people in Rapture. When economic depression hit the city, Grace Holloway started to experience racial discrimination that she thought she'd be rid of under the sea, and eventually found solace in Sophia Lamb's cult. Grace is our level boss for Popper's Drop, the mayor of the town, and it's through her that we see yet more parallels between Sophia Lamb and Jim Jones. Jones himself knew his target audience. Just like Lamb, he would scoop up homeless people and shove them into his cult, offering up socialism as an easy way out. Rapture, just like 1970s America, had created a subclass of citizen that simply had nowhere else to turn. His congregation was primarily made up of African Americans, and he would regularly push them into the cause with a capital C by encouraging them to segregate themselves, separating his followers from other Americans. Leslie Wagner Wilson, a survivor of Jonestown, writes about this in her book Slavery of Faith. Quote, the school I attended had very few kids of colour, but that was no different than Santa Rosa. I was taken aside and told that the temple kids hung out together and didn't associate with kids who weren't in the church. We were told the other kids weren't like us. We were born to change the world. This is the precise type of language that Sophia Lamb uses. She separates her followers from the unwashed masses through the butterfly pins. She straight up tells her daughter Eleanor that she was born to change the world. She, just like Jim Jones, capitalizes on racism, bigotry, and the class segregation of Pauper's Drop. Again, she doesn't truly care about equality. Her entire plan hinges on creating a new species of human because she doesn't believe her followers are capable of making a utopia. As for where we are, the train has come to yet another unexpected stop. Grace Holloway has locked us off from the rest of Rapture, and the only way we're going to get back on track, pun intended, is if we steal a genetic key from her. Popper's Drop is where the game starts to embed its many, many, many combat arenas that dominate Bioshock 2's game time. So, while we muscle through the rubble and the dirt, we're going to look at the sequel's most substantial improvement. That thing's a miracle in Technicolor, kid. Works like a movie camera. Start the film rolling before you open fire on a splicer, and then anything you hit him with tells you more about his DNA. I still don't like the research camera in principle, but even with that bias, I've got to admit it's way better than it was in Bioshock 1. The HUD is less intrusive for a start, but it's also a mechanical means of encouraging the player to experiment. Different enemies have different weaknesses, and the only way to learn those weaknesses is through hitting the record button and trying out different attacks. And you can't just spam it on a baddie anymore either, because the effectiveness is diminished if you try to repeat yourself. Experimentation is the name of the game. You fight a lot more in Lamb's Rapture than you ever did in Rhine's, and the levels have been designed as expansive arenas littered with options and environmental attacks that you can capitalize on. Popper's Drop has a huge space with the fishbowl diner right in the centre. Cameras are littered all around, and a couple of security bots roam, so you're encouraged to hack them from a distance to turn the odds in your favour. The roof of the diner houses sandbags and a couple of entry points, so you can secure the high ground before chaos descends. You could argue that the arenas are too clearly telegraphed, meaning they feel a little artificial when you enter them. Ah, there are a bunch of cameras here, there are walkways up above, I guess there's going to be a siege in a few minutes, but this telegraphing means that the player could be proactive in combat rather than reactive. Cyclone plasmids, rivet traps, mini turrets, hacking cameras, hacking turrets, hacking bots, destroying first aid machines, proximity mines, Bioshock 2 arms you with plenty of ways to transform a combat arena into your own personal hunting ground. The game understands what sort of game feel its combat is capable of. The iron sights are still next to useless, so getting up close and personal with splicers is the way to go. You can now crack an enemy's skull if you run out of ammo, rather than exposing yourself while relying on that purposefully slow reload animation. Even after death, Atlas's advice from the first game remains true. The best strategy is always just to zap them and whack them. Playing as a big daddy leans into feeling like a tank without sacrificing speed, and thank Christ because our enemy are more nimble than ever. Their AI has been upgraded to concentrate less on rushing you and more on keeping out of the way and overwhelming you with their numbers instead. And that's the key word when describing B2's battles. Overwhelming. Sophia Lamb uses the collective against us, thematically tying her many against the few mantra with how fights play out. On our journey, we see countless screens with her face plastered all over them. Between propaganda announcements, she'll take to the microphone and rally troops to hunt us down. The designs of splicers have been given more detail as well, showing the passage of time to make them more broken and more rotten. Sometimes I 
upside down pie bowl with old can can girl. And if anybody gets slippy, pal, cut the bomb. I saved a whole kindergarten full of cutesy little brats, and went up happy ever after. We're encouraged to have a little more empathy for Lamb's followers because of this. Their combat dialogue is less funny and more tragic. Gone are the elitist women ranting out servants no longer there. Gone are the toasty splicers who spew nonsense about their most recent date. Now you're fighting husks crying in the darkness about how they'll give everything to Eleanor to make a brighter world. Dystopian Rapture is shown off best in its enemy designs. Later in the game, we're introduced to Alpha Big Daddies, original prototypes like us who have no allegiance to anyone, Lamb, the Splicers, or even Delta. Introducing them into endgame levels like, say, Persephone adds a whole new level to the chaos of fights. Three factions tearing each other to shreds, requiring some forethought to whether or not you want to keep them alive. This is different from the standard Big Daddies, who only attack us if we lash out first. The Alphas will kill anything in its path, so there's a risk-reward to be considered when we face one. Do we keep them alive so they can hurt the Splicers too, or do we get them out of the way because they pose such a threat to us on the battlefield? There's even an overhaul of Big Daddy enemy types as well. Alphas are just one example. We also have Rumblers, armed with a grenade launcher that do a colossal amount of damage compared to their pals. The most interesting addition to Bioshock's roster of enemies are the Big Sisters. Sisters, though. They're completely optional if you don't interact with the Little Sisters and have a masterful control over plasmid abilities. They'll appear with fully upgraded powers, as agile as a spider splicer and as impenetrable as a big daddy. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them is a consistent highlight across the game. They can heal by draining nearby splicers, so an aggressive strategy is a must, despite their imposing form and speed making you keen to turn tail and run away. Brute splicers, big meatheads that throw stuff at you and launch themselves for an up-close brawl, become one of the big biggest pains in the arse across my playtime. In some cases, they can take more damage than a big daddy, and you typically face them among a group so they can swarm you in seconds. We face our first one when we try to get into Sinclair's hotel. It knocks down a wall and runs off, forcing us to jump through a fair few convoluted hoops to earn the drill dash move. Between the drill, rivet gun, spear gun, shotgun and grenade launcher, Irrational have gone out of their way to make you feel like a one-man armoured army that always has something new to try when faced with impossible odds. And the odds do feel impossible. Bioshock 2 is a much harder game than Bioshock 1, and I think that's for two specific reasons. The first is that Splicers are tanky. Even the lowest level grunt will take a few shots to the head before going down, and as I mentioned before, the game throws chunks of them at you at any given time. This is kind of frustrating, because it feels so unnecessary. The health of Splicers needed to be tweaked so that they would hit the deck with ease and instead just rely on their high numbers to get some licks in. There are enough big boys in Rapture to pose a serious threat. We don't need Jimbo McHi damage to to gobble up all of our ammo at the same time. And then there's the plasmids. Set traps for unsuspecting enemies. Lure your foes into deadly ambushes. Hallelujah, praise the lamb, we can finally dual wield! Nothing is more satisfying than shooting a chain of lightning at a big daddy while unleashing a minigun right into its face. There's not much to really analyze there, it's just a great change and every Bioshock game should include it after this one. It's just a shame that B2 didn't bring any new plasmids to the table. Gil Alexander has been pumping out new gene and engineering tonics this whole time, so it wouldn't break the canon to have, say, a teleportation plasmid that could work like Blink does in Dishonored. The game even blue balls us by showing us a teleportation plasmid, but we're never awarded the power, just a gene tonic instead. The alternate ammunition is more creative here too. Anti-personnel rounds are still available and useful, but they pale in comparison to rocket spears that not just explode after a couple of seconds, but also launch an enemy across a room. Bioshock's goofy physics were always a surefire way to find the fun, and I love that Irrational have leaned into this in a fair few ways. Bioshock 2 doesn't just limit its fights to combat arenas. There's variation in the context of these fights as well, just like in Bioshock 1, even if the moments don't stand out quite as strongly. In Fontaine Futuristics, we're forced to put on a show for a dead audience, displaying plasmid powers for Gil Alexander. At the end of the game, we spend a whole level working alongside Eleanor in a big sister suit. Here in Popper's Drop, we're cast into complete darkness while we hunt for Grace Holloway through a labyrinth of hotel rooms, nothing but our torch and the empty echoing of our big lumbering steps to guide us. Dr. Lamb trusted me to care for her child, and I tried, but baby Eleanor disappeared. And then one day, I see her walking with you, looking wrong. And when I tried to hold her, you knocked me down, broke my jaw. 
It's here we learn that Sophia Lam was secretly imprisoned in Rapture's jail by Andrew Ryan, suddenly fearing her gospel of collectivism. Grace Holloway looked after Eleanor while Sophia was locked away, and never recovered after Eleanor was kidnapped and turned into a little sister. Grace blames us. She calls us Tin Daddy, thinking we're the one who stole away Eleanor, and the irony is, she sees us as a creature that lacks the self. To Grace Holloway, we're not a thinking man, but a monster, and when we finally find her, she's so scared of us that she doesn't even try to attack, leaving her fate in our hands. On my first playthrough, I left Grace alone. I took the genetic key from her and headed back to the train station. I pitied her. She was so blindly in love with Sophia Lamb, so riddled with guilt over the disappearance of Eleanor, so wretched in the poverty that Andrew Ryan forced her into, that I let her be. I was dealt his conscience, his self, and he let her live. Hear me, O oh ye who would murder the Lamb of God, ye shall never reach her garden. Siren Alley is Bioshock 2's greatest disappointment. Our train is blown to hell by Father Simon Wales, which means our journey to Eleanor is taking a short detour through the Temple of the Lamb, where Sophia's followers transformed her ideology into straight-up religion. Sounds pretty cool, right? Especially for a game that up until now has sloshed cult imagery over our big daddy visor to the point where it's almost oversaturated. Father Wales and Siren Alley has been slowly built up in the background of other levels, wetting our anticipation for what might wait for us inside his church. We are descending into the heart of Lamb's cult now, so it's exciting to wonder what the game will say. But Siren Alley is barren and confused. The majority of the level doesn't explore the Temple of the Lamb, instead we're stomping around a brothel for an hour before a lackluster boss fight in a chapel. Despite some really cool and unnerving concept art, Wales is the only side character who doesn't get a unique model in the game, relegated to a spider splicer with black clothes. You spend more time learning about his brother Daniel than you do about the father himself, and his belief system is only surface deep. Brothers and sisters, the temptation to languish in self-pity is great. Who can deny it? beleaguered as we are by the sins of our past. But self-pity is no more than a tricky shade of pride, freezing us up when we should act. The Lamb's path leads us beyond the reach of the self, obliterating the ego. But we must work for it. We must not lie caged in our bones, groveling at the ego's altar. This is an audio diary that was removed from the game. There are six of these that just sit on the Cult of Rapture website, never included in the base game or added to the remastered collection. They detail Simon Wales finding God, hearing his slow descent into madness and the various preachings he would give. Why are they not in the game? Luckily, the few audio logs we can find for Wales are among the longest in the story. Once again, we could draw parallels to Jim Jones. Some of his sermons would go on for 13 or 14 hours, where half of his congregation would fall asleep before it came to an end. Like, did nobody tell him? Sophia Lamb doesn't particularly care for religion. She saw Simon Wales and his religious belief system as a useful tool. She describes God as nothing more than our moral duty to others, just how Jones conflated God with socialism. Quote, Christianity was never based on the idea of an unknown God. It was based on a human God. Jesus was flesh of your flesh, bone of your bone, and he was believed to be God. What do we believe in? You believe in me, in order to believe in you. That's the only thing gonna set you free. I'm not your sky god. I'm socialism. But there's a fair few problems with this, both for Jim Jones and for Sophia Lamb. Socialism comes from Marxism, Karl Marx was famously anti-God, anti-religious. That quote, religion is the opiate of the masses, that came from Marx. A religion like Christianity that believes in a higher authority flies in the face of socialist belief systems because socialism in its purest sense doesn't put any being on a pedestal, whether they're God or not. For Lamb, this is yet another example of how unsuitable she is to write about and preach socialism. She relies heavily on Father Wales, a fiercely religious lieutenant, to teach her gospel. In Siren Alley, we learn more about what that religion is. Just like Father Jim Jones, Father Wales blended myth, legend, and Christianity to form his own bastardized belief system. There are two examples of this. The first is he loosely cites the Demiurge, a creature from Platonic philosophy that helped shape the Earth. This is an example of how more depth was needed to really flesh out what he believed, because it seems a little random. The second is far more interesting when it comes to Bioshock's world. Lord, what more do 
Can you wish him me? Your wretch of a servant waits for word. I have followed the letter of the Holy Mother Lamb, though she will not tell me the day of your return. I watched as you smote down the false father, Andrew Ryan, who tempted us away from your radiant gaze. But you would not speak to me, Lord. Simon Wales sees Jack, our character from Bioshock 1, as a prophet. After the death of Andrew Ryan, Wales adopted those events into his myths, depicting Jack as a selfless incarnation of God who punished smugglers, murderers, and anyone else who believed in the Great Chain. I guess he missed the last third of the game where Jack set off on a selfish quest for revenge. Siren Alley is more like a museum than a place of worship. We see Adam needles placed on mantles, promising that these would be the tools through which Rapture's people would be saved. Huge paintings adorn the walls, showing Jack's arrival to Rapture and various moments from his story. Which is great, but then there's this painting, this confusing, odd painting of Dr. J. Steinman. He's one of my favourite characters in Bioshock 1, so it's good to see him getting some love, but I have no idea why there's such a massive portrayal of a cosmetic surgeon in Wales's House of Worship. There doesn't seem to be much to break down here. Presumably Wales just really liked that moment in the first game where Steinman strung up his patience on crucifixes. It's stuff like this that could have done with more exploration in Siren Alley, rather than wasting time with Daniel Wales becoming a pimp. That's not what we're here to learn about, it's not what we're interested in, and as a result, Siren Alley feels confused. And it's not the only level that suffers from that. Oh, also, 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 where did he get this Temple of the Lamb banner printed? Why does he use Andrew Ryan's favourite font? Stupid. <sighs> right, well while Delta hunts for whales, let's talk upgrades. Okay, plasmids first. Bioshock 2 fixes one of my biggest issues with the original, and that is how it handles the upgrading of your superpowers. No longer is an upgrade limited to damage output, it now offers tweaks to how those powers work. One of my favourites, the Cyclone Trap, can be upgraded to blend elements together, so you can create a fiery vortex that engulfs enemies, or a landmine that activates a hive of bees. You can spray fire or lightning without sacrificing anything at all, an upgrade feels like an upgrade here. And at the risk of sounding like a rapture vending machine, that's not all folks. Power to the people machines are back, groaning and creaking under the weight of overuse. Guns still visually change with upgrades, which is always so damn pleasing to see, but they're also so flashy now. Increasing your damage output now comes with extras. The shotgun can be transformed into a bringer of lightning doom by adding a tesla coil. Get some, you son of a bitch! Rapture's dystopia offers up ammo aplenty in trash cans and vending machines just like before, but I do say that with a caveat. Because the enemies are so tanky, so brimming with vitality, that it never quite feels like enough. The ammunition splicers drop almost feels random. I don't know how much shotgun ammo I was finding, despite always being at maximum. The balancing in Bioshock 1 always felt a little bit more fine-tuned. I can't find any evidence of this online, so it is pure speculation, I admit, but I think Bioshock 1's enemies might have been programmed to drop bullets you needed. Whether on purpose or by accident, that seems to have been forgotten here. You'd think it would add tension, but what it truly means is you're forced into trying out all playstyles, not able to find a favourite. Bioshock 2's economy is stingier than a Tory on tax day. Everything is simply more expensive. Rapture experienced a dire economic collapse following its civil war, but I don't know why it's been hit by inflation after Jack killed Andrew Ryan. Rapture had already fallen into anarchy by then, so it's hard to imagine someone running around and programming the vending machines to try and stabilise an economy that Sophia Lamb does not care for. To make up for this, our wallet limit has been upped to 600 now, so we can at least carry more coin to keep up with it, but again, all of this feels really unnecessary. Why increase the value of stuff we can buy if you're just going to give us more money anyway? The real stinginess comes from Adam. Gene tonics and plasmids are as pricey as ever, but the slug juice we need to slurp up is scattered. Bioshock 1's Adam was simple to find. You either save or hurt a little sister, and both would give you a big chunk of Adam. In Bioshock 2, Adam gathering is slightly more complicated. There are four ways to get it now. The first is from finding the sea slugs during our handful of walks under the ocean. There aren't many of these, and they award a measly 10 Adam each. The second is from battling big sisters, the toughest fights in the game that give us 40 Adam. The third way is from harvesting the little sisters themselves. This gives us 160 Adam, and the fourth way is from teaming up with the little sister and taking them to a couple of corpses to suck out the Adam. 
This gives us 35 Adam per corpse. If the player chooses to save the Little Sisters rather than harvest them, they can take a total of 3,240 Adam home. Harvesting all of them will give us much more, with 3,430. This is much more than the total Adam we can get in Bioshock 1, true, but the amount you can get at any one time is so much less, meaning it feels more cumbersome and labour-intensive to buy new plasmids or upgrades. And we're not even talking about what this means for the moral choice system here, but we will get to it. Don't worry. Not with a bang, but a whimper does Father Simon Wales die, vomiting up his potential and lying in a pool of it. We gun him down in his church and are introduced to one of our many, many points of no return. As a last ditch effort to stop us, Sophia Lamb floods Siren Alley. Washing away her temple and writing off the death of the whales is nothing to worry about. This is one hell of a spectacle, but it's just one of three times where Sophia Lamb or one of her lackeys floods a level. It's an artificial way to ensure that we don't come back here, which is incredibly frustrating. In Bioshock 1, you could use the bathysphere to return to levels you'd previously completed. This helped you to return to areas and look at them in a whole new light with the context you'd gathered during exploration. To avoid repetition, Bioshock 2 replaces the bathysphere with the train, but then blows that train to hell and floods three of the levels so you can never return to them. This again feels unnecessary. The price of Irrational showing off their shiny new flood system or forcing us to walk through the ocean to take in the pretty sights. Our slow ocean walk eventually takes us to Dionysus Park, and as much as it pains me to say, my criticisms don't stop there. Bizarrely, Bioshock 2 does not use ghostly visions to further its storytelling, not like its predecessor did. Jack's excavation of Rapture made audiologues popular in the game's fear, but he would also have flashes of memories, echoing through the gloom at certain scripted moments. We'd see patients of Dr. Steinman regretting their surgery, Atlas rallying his troops, and it added some much-needed flavour to how he hoovered up Bioshock's tale. For some reason, Delta isn't treated to these visions, and I find this particularly baffling because one of the key beats of this story is that splicing infuses you with memories and experiences from the person you stole Adam from. Delta steals just as much Adam as Jack did, so why don't we get to see Lamb's rapture in its heyday? The inclusion of these visions would just be one of the ways Irrational could have made Dionysus Park remotely interesting, but just like Siren Alley, it does not fulfil its potential as a level. Dionysus Park was owned by Sophia Lamb, Chief. Sort of a private retreat for her social experiments. One night it flooded, killing all her guests paper said it was cult related. Lamb created Dionysus Park as a safe haven where all artists could present their work unrestrained. The park was open to the public free of charge, to spread Lamb's philosophy and to subtly slander Andrew Ryan. In that way, the park has similarities to both Fort Frolic and Arcadia, which started charging its visitors. This should be where Bioshock 2 gets to really show off its environmental storytelling. That's one of the staples of this series, let's face it. The environmental artists at Irrational are the reason why people like the Bioshock games. We can talk about improvements to combat or hacking all we like, but really, everything else is just a bonus to the environments. A park dedicated to collectivist art, to paintings and poetry and music that speaks out against Andrew Ryan and objectivism and showcases the benefits of socialism is popping with potential. We get absolutely none of this potential during our time down here. In classic Bioshock 2 fashion, the park was flooded, drowning the residents in an act of murder that was labelled by Raptors Press as a cultish mass suicide. The Rapture Tribune would run headlines that Lamb's followers only had themselves to blame. After all, they drank the Kool-Aid. Okay, so dead men tell no tales, right? <laughs> Wrong. See, with Adam involved, every stiff's got a story. And Lamb knows how to read it. If that stuff makes it back to her, I'm an obituary. Contrary to popular belief, it wasn't Lamb who flooded the park. It was a disgraced paparazzi known as Stanley Poole. Stanley was hired by Ryan to infiltrate the cult, write up an expose, and find evidence of Lamb's crimes so that Ryan could arrest her. Sophia Lamb, foolishly, let Stanley into her family, ultimately leaving Dionysus Park in his care when she was dragged off to prison. 
Stanley is a runty little worm. I'd go so far as to say he's the most unlikable character in the game. He has no beliefs, nothing he stands for, he's just a sweaty, selfish roach. Look at his face, I hate him, look at him! He's locked down the train to Fontaine Futuristics and will only let us leave if we do him a favour. We've got to get rid of the little sisters in this level because he's scared they'll report back to Lamb and tell her he's still alive. So unlike, say, Fort Frolic, where our mission is to create an insane piece of snuff art while learning about objectivist artistry, Dionysus Park's mission repeats the formula we've seen before. Stomp around the level, scoop up the little sisters, and leave. So let's talk about environmental storytelling, because as much as I'm railing against Dionysus Park, there's still some really great stuff in Bioshock 2's presentation. Irrational have gone all out with portraying Rapture after the Kool-Aid as decimated. Rot is everywhere, reinforced by our constant ocean bed walks to show us how easily the city can be opened up to the elements. Bioshock 1's rapture burrowed, windows were rare, so sometimes it would feel like tunnels we were navigating rather than a city beneath the sea. Bioshock 2 gives us grand vista shots of the ocean regularly. Corpses float above tunnels and walkways. The neon signs in the distance are flickering or shut off entirely. That doesn't mean Bioshock 2 is shrouded in gloom, however. Sure, the neon signs that defined Rapture's hypercapitalism are pretty much gone, but they're replaced with a more natural source of light in the plant life. Seaweed infused with Adam shines through the darkness. Barnacles cover almost every surface. Here, Rapture is simply wetter and slimier. The walls are drooling, the architecture is melting like Jim Jones in an interview. Seriously, I still can't go over how much this guy sweats. We see this decay detailed in unlikely places. The Circus of Values vending machines glitch out when you interact with them. They still speak, but the voice recording sounds corrupted and frayed. Oh, and as a quick aside, this is actually the voice of Bioshock 1's creative director, Ken Levine. Good stuff, but it's not the only example of an asset irrational of run through the grinder to show off the state of Rapture. Popcorn machines have been turned into food banks, selling old, presumably rotting meat. The propaganda banners that populated Andrew Ryan's halls are shredded and torn. Signage and posters have been vandalised, trying desperately to erase Rapture's objectivist past. To top this, that cynical sense of humour still remains. One of my personal highlights is actually in Siren Alley. We find a diner with two partners lying dead at a table, plates of moulding cheese lying in front of them. If you turn around, you'll see a Rapturian poster watching over them, advertising fresh, quality, Rapture-grown cheese, mm. It's in the statues that each level is given its visual identity. Hogarth de la Plante, great name, was Bioshock 2's lead environment artist and it feels like he was given a mandate to create sculptures that summed up each level in a moment. In the Adonis Resort we have women crucified, martyrs for their cause, just like Sophia Lamb sees herself. In Fontaine Futuristics the statues are big daddies, apt because this is where our tin monsters were created and performed shows to advertise plasmids. In Dionysus Park the statues are covered up, for some reason. This level is just so confusing. The park raises a lot of questions, but it doesn't even offer hints to the answers. One of these questions is actually all about our favourite extra boy, spelt with an I, Sander Cohen. Despite being Andrew Ryan's songbird, essentially a jilted lover of Rapture's King, Cohen seems to have defected, I guess, and set up his own exhibition in Sophia Lamb's gallery. When did this happen? In Bioshock 1, we are led to believe that Cohen has just fallen out of favour with Ryan because Ryan wouldn't come and see his shows. The park is crying out for a Sander Cohen audio log that explains why he set up shop in someone else's gallery, despite owning the entirety of Fort Frolic, and then a second audio log that explains why all of this stuff has been covered over with sheets. If Lamb did this, why did she let Cohen exhibit his art in the first place? Your yellow eye gone. My name is Biff, and I saw you the other day at the Milgo Round. I think you are very pretty, and I like your blue dress and the songs you sing about angels. The game almost makes up for getting rid of the ghostly visions by increasing the variety of its audio logs. There are more speakers this time, more voices explaining their perspective on Rapture. Some of the audio logs have full character arcs, like say, Mark Meltzer, and others are throwaway tidbits that add new angles to how we see the city. I'm especially reminded of wee Billy Parson. He was a little boy who fancied one of the little sisters and picked a rose to give to her. 
Because his mother wouldn't let him speak to the sister, he hid it behind a passcode and left an audio log for the girl with that very code. Of course, we find the code instead, but this is a gorgeous little bit of optional storytelling that we can follow. Another is from the perspective of one of the prostitutes that worked in Siren Alley, labelling how splicing had evolved into a kink, not just an addiction, and she'd had a few Johns asking her to splice up with them. As we work through the brothel, we find more and more corpses, strung up with needles sticking out of them, showing that Simon Wales, presumably, turned his followers against sex and sex workers. Returning to Mark Meltzer, we almost catch up to him in Dionysus Park. He's journeyed to Rapture to try and rescue his daughter from the clutches of Lamb's cult, and the majority of his investigation was available on the Cult of Rapture website prior to the game's release. There are moments where you think Delta might in fact be Mark, but thankfully that predictable twist never comes true. When we turn a corner, we're rushed by a big daddy in a rage, and it's only after we kill him and loot him that we see he was captured by a lamb and transformed into another tin daddy. This all feels incredibly natural, not at all forced. It's really, really fantastic. This is not a sermon. I will offer no insight. Every word I speak you already know. Utopia. Said aloud, it evokes heaven on earth. Yet the word means both good place and no place. The advertisements that once played out over the speakers have now been replaced with daily readings by Sophia Lamb. You can barely walk five steps without her patronising tones echoing around a chamber. Because they don't get subtitles, it can be really tricky to fully hear what she's preaching, but if you break through the noise, you'll realise they sound like Bible verses. What she's actually doing is reading excerpts from her book, Unity and Metamorphosis. We'll see copies in every single level up to the credits. The language of these speeches is so careful, so calculating in its imagery. She purposefully separates herself from Fontaine when she tells us she's not a businesswoman, casts aside Ryan when she removes her link from the Great Chain, refuses to call herself a liberator like Atlas. Sophia Lamb, in her pure narcissism, thinks she's completely different from Rapture's previous despots. Even her view of art is in direct contrast to Andrew Ryan's. She believed in unconscious art, a form of expression taken from Sigmund Freud and popularised through surrealism. Where Andrew Ryan and Ayn Rand believed in metaphysical art, Sophia Lamb was all about giving up rational control and letting your subconscious do all the work. You might remember exercises in school where your art teacher would encourage you to just take a paintbrush, clear your mind, and let it dance on the paper. That is what Lamb believed to be good art. Or at least, I think that's what she believed to be good art, because Dionysus Park doesn't give us any example of this. The sculptures we see are much more similar to Ayn Rand's type of art than anything else. Realistic recreations of animals, paintings of historical moments. In fact, the only reason we know that Sophia Lamb encouraged unconscious art is because of a single audio log. This one. Dionysus Park. Lamb mocks me in the naming of this place. She knows precisely how I feel about this celebration of unconscious art. The artist reflects the world as it ought to be, not as it is damned to be by some spasm of the lower mind. It's not even from Lamb. What a disappointment. And the problems don't stop there. Lamb's followers have constructed shrines to her and Eleanor across Rapture. Photographs of missing people are repeated over and over. Tragic reminders that the creatures we're drilling into were once people. Splashed near these shrines are carefully curated phrases. Lamb is watching. The daughter of the Lamb will save us. And most importantly of all, Imago is coming. This was fascinating to me when returning to the game for this video. Imago would keep returning in the graffiti we see. I thought perhaps it was a parallel to the Manson family's Helter Skelter, apocalyptic warnings of a war that was coming. When Delta reached Dionysus Park and I saw there was an Imago exhibit we could visit, it was my first stop. Finally, some answers. And there's nothing here. A frozen icebox with some turrets and cameras. Not a single work of art. Not a single explanation of what Imago is. Arguably the most important area in Dionysus Park, and it's a glorified fridge. Why? In fact, nowhere in Bioshock 2 is Imago explained. I later had to go away and look it up myself, and thankfully the internet gave me a definition. Quote, Imago is the second full-length album by the band The Butterfly... Wait a minute, no, that's not it. Let me call in some backup. During metamorphosis, insects such as butterflies go through a few stages. 
The final stage is called Imago, where the transformation is complete. Well, that makes a lot more sense. Butterflies are constant symbols in Bioshock 2's environment. Pictures of Sophia Lamb are adorned with them. They hang from the reception area of Popper's Drop. Lamb's entire creed is based around creating a being of pure selflessness that only lives for others. She's trying to transform Eleanor into that being, a utopian, and her cult believes they'll be saved through Eleanor. What an awesome metaphor that the game doesn't explore and I had to Google. By now I think I've ranted enough about Dionysus Park. In fact, I've ranted so much that Delta's dealt with the last of the little sisters and Stanley's ready to let us leave, but not before the game offers up a couple of big reveals. Now, you were just a deep sea explorer with iron cojones, pal. The public gave you a nickname, but Ryan was sure you were a spook. So his people locked you up, erased your damn name. Goodbye, Johnny Topside. Hello, Subject Delta. We, just like Mark Meltzer, just like Jack, were a late arrival to Rapture. Stanley Poole ratted us out to Andrew Ryan, and Ryan, believing we were a CIA spy, locked us away in Persephone. Stanley is the reason we're a big daddy. But wait, that's not all. Stanley was also the one who kidnapped Eleanor and sold her off to be turned into a little sister. Grace Holloway had it wrong. We never took the child. It was all Stanley Poole. He is directly responsible for the monstrous state that Delta and Eleanor are in. And wouldn't you know it, when we're offered up a chance to kill him, my Delta had absolutely no sympathy for the little runt. How do my bullets taste, Stanley? This is it, Chief. End of the line. If I'm right, Eleanor's mama's using Adam to force all Rapture's minds and memories into the poor girl. Lamb reckons it'll make that child a saint. Now, Eleanor's in a deep, dark place beneath Fontaine headquarters, and to keep you alive, we need to sneak in and find her. Fontaine Futuristics is where Sophia Lamb's plan begins to take shape. Up until now, we know she's been using Eleanor to do something that furthers her collectivist ideals, but what exactly that something is hasn't necessarily been clear. Gil Alexander, who repurposed Fontaine's factory for Sophia Lamb, provides us with all the answers. Or should I say, Alex the Great. The Gil we hear from is no longer present. He tells us that by the time we hear the recordings that are left for us, he'll be clinically insane, changing his name to Alex the Great and locking down the factory. So Gil charges us with a simple objective. Hunt down this new insane version of himself and kill him. Our tour of Fontaine Futuristics doesn't teach us much that's new, but I appreciate Bioshock 2 giving us a level that's dedicated to one of the most historic moments in Rapture's story, when Andrew Ryan broke his objectivist code and seized Frank Fontaine's business. We get to see the tape, the boxes, the littered supplies, we get to hear how Gil Alexander worked for Frank Fontaine, then Andrew Ryan, and finally Sophia Lamb, frog leaping between masters so long as he can invest himself in his work. His insanity also shows off his greatest insecurity. Splattered on the floors, the walls, and garbled from over the speakers is the phrase, you're fired, showing that the corporate chain Gil was a part of left him in constant fear of unemployment if he couldn't adapt to the constant change in management. We're returning to our fetch quest roots once again with a long hunt for security consoles, then a long hunt for Adam-infused plants, but thankfully it gives us plenty of time to get to know both Gil Alexander and Alex the Great, and consider how they embody Bioshock 2's most important theme, the self. The dark side of the self is the most dangerous thing of all, precisely because the self is the greatest power in the psyche. It can cause people to spin megalomaniac or other delusory fantasies that catch them up and possess them. A person in this state thinks with mounting excitement that he has grasped and solved the great cosmic riddles. He therefore loses all touch with human reality. These are the words of Carl Jung, an audiobook excerpt from his essay Man and His Symbols. Through his studies, Jung argued that human beings are connected to each other through a shared set of experiences. Nobody is truly individual because we all experience the same reality. Andrew Ryan and Ayn Rand would scoff at this, but it's a belief shared by Sophia Lamb to the point where she undertook a gross experiment to see if it was true. After Eleanor was turned into a little sister, Sophia saw it as a special opportunity. Eleanor now shared a consciousness with other sisters. She could experience their reality all at once. 
Because of how her body had been engineered, Adam splicing would no longer disfigure her and warp her mind. Adam also carried with it the memories of Rapturians, so what happened if, slowly, Lamb could pump all of that Adam, all of those memories, all of those experiences into her daughter. She believed that she could create a utopian, someone who is completely empathetic, completely selfless. Because Eleanor would experience all of the pain and hurt of a selfish society, Lamb believed that she would reject it. She'd be rid of the selfish gene and live only for the collective. But of course, Lamb wasn't going to just start splicing her daughter without a test subject, so she first tried this experiment on Gil Alexander. Dr. Alexander has agreed to accept both measures of the new utopian project. He will become a kind of genetic chimera, host to all the minds of Rapture, accessing their talents and memories via the Adam we have gathered. And deriving in part from Project WYK, I have developed a new set of behavioral constraints. Dr. Alexander will live to promote the common good this is why Gil has gone insane. This is why he's become Alex the Great. The irony is that in becoming this amalgamation of Rapture's greatest minds, he also becomes incredibly egocentric. All the evidence you need is in the new title that he gives himself, but he also dedicates his existence to the cause with a capital C. It's just a shame that in his case the cause is a corporate entity, Fontaine Futuristics. Gil Alexander is here so that Bioshock 2 can highlight an incredibly important part of what it's exploring. The collectivism isn't always strictly socialist. Sometimes it's capitalist. And Marx's criticism, which was mostly about unequal power relationships, Derrida went deeper than that. And the, the postmodernists that occupy the universities are anti-individual right down to the right down to the bedrock. Oh, Jordan Peterson, you're always so reliable when I'm looking for bullshit artists. Peterson, seen here crying like a little baby because people were mean to him on Twitter, is making my favorite type of mistake, a common one. He's claiming that collectivism, Marxism, and socialism are the same thing, and then goes on to conflate that with fascism. He loves to do this, using my favorite type of fallacy, the slippery slope. Capitalist collectivism exists today, right outside your window. Think about how your personal expressions are policed by your workplace, like when Netflix fired a trans employee for criticizing Dave Chappelle's shitty stand-up show. Think of Amazon, a pioneer in sacrificing the sanctity and dignity of the individual to the company. The employees serve the corporation rather than the other way around. Or what about Sinclair Broadcasting? Remember this? The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish and publish simply aren't true without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think, and this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. You can't get more capitalist or more collectivist than American news conglomerates. Where's George? Jordan Peterson's focus on free speech here. Come on, Jordan, the people need you. Do something, worm boy. You get the idea. We see examples of capitalist collectivism at a fair few points throughout Bioshock 2. Gil Alexander shows this off beautifully when he drinks the Kool-Aid, is stripped of his individuality, and rubbed down to his shadow of himself, scouring Frank Fontaine's corporation and singing jingles. Think about Andrew Ryan, who charged people to learn more about his objectivist cult, giving up their own personal thoughts and experiences of the surface world, and letting him think for them. Alex the Great is an irritating presence, and that's quite purposeful. He buzzes around the level while we're just trying to progress, yelling at us and setting us back whenever he gets the chance. When we try to get into a control room, he stops us from using a voice recognizer by singing Rapture's national anthem. The whole level really conditions us to see him as nothing more than an annoying fly that needs to be smooshed. To keep to the Kool-Aid metaphor, Alex the Great stands as an example of what happens when you guzzle it wholesale. He literally drank the atom of great thinkers and it transformed him into this incredulous corporate beast. Because that's what Rapture's great thinkers were thinking about. Even if you agree with Sophia Lamb's philosophy, even if you strip away her narcissism and the fact she's taken away the free will of her daughter, her plan was always doomed to fail because of the ashes her phoenix is rising from. Rapture was specifically designed to be a corporate, capitalist, selfish utopia. The shared experience of its denizens was just that, so mixing their memories into a bowl and drinking it wouldn't make you a selfless empath, it would make you, well, this. 
I'm sorry. Oh, please. I will go outside. I will live outside. Jim Jones made himself the figurehead of the People's Temple. He claimed that socialism was the cause, but he was. He positioned himself as a socialist god, so his collective weren't living for each other, they were living for him, which isn't socialist at all. Rapturians similarly aren't living for each other, they're living for Eleanor. Lamb makes Eleanor the cause because she's given up on the human experience altogether. It's why Wales worships her, why Grace Holloway would sacrifice herself for her, why Gil Alexander transforms himself into Alex the Great for her. And it's also important to note how the shared consciousness was exploited by Jones on the final day of the People's Temple. There is a 44 minute recording, now known as the death tape, that lets us hear exactly what happened as Jones wheeled out the flavour aid and handed out the cups at gunpoint. It's a very, very difficult listen. I've linked it below for the sake of transparency, but I will ask that you proceed with caution if you seek it out. However, I want to flag the sort of language Jones uses in that tape. He constantly refers to the temple as we. One of the most famous quotes from the tape is, without me, Life has no meaning. You are a part of me. He calls on the collective to commit revolutionary suicide for the cause. And while Lamb doesn't use that exact term, it's what she calls on Rapturians to do for Eleanor. Sacrifice yourself and give up your Adam for the daughter. Die and be infused with her. Lamb goes so far as to argue that we don't even have an individual soul, but one force that binds us together. What is the soul? An ineffable spark of continuity. Living within us, yet beyond us. Mortality, our eldest truth, and the soul, our eldest contradiction. I submit the following conclusion. The soul is not in us, but between us. When we finally reach the body of Alex the Great, the choice laid out before us feels like the most important in the game, despite being equally weighted in what sort of ending we'll get. We don't get to see him clearly in the massive tank that holds him, a smart idea because no visual depiction could do justice to what our imagination has already conjured. A recording of Gil Alexander appears and begs us to kill his future self, to kill Alex. This pits the self, Gil, against the collective, Alex. For this playthrough, I killed Alex the Great, but even recording this, I couldn't tell you what the right decision is. It's a masterfully put together piece of characterization. I would argue that Fontaine Futuristics has some of the strongest moral writing in the entire series. On one hand, you have a very sane, very sad man begging you to put him out of his misery, and the, on the other hand, you have an insane collection of personalities, memories and experiences begging you to let them live. Which version's wishes are more important? Gil's request is premeditated, his brain chemistry is untouched by Adam when he makes these recordings, so he's well within his own mind. It's assisted suicide, right? But even if you remove Alex the Great's madness from the equation, how much of a right do we have to erase all of these great thinkers, these collective experiences, just because one guy from 10 years ago wants us to do it? Oh Christ, that's depressing. Can we talk about something else? This is Mrs. Pearl Porter speaking. Away. And I'm recording this message with my brilliant husband, whom I love very much. Ah, dead wives. Perfect. I wasn't going to talk about Bioshock 2's DLC, but Minerva's Den really is some of the best that the game has to offer, and all of these years later, it feels almost insulting to discuss it without mentioning its best bit, so we're going to take a quick break from Delta, Sophia, Eleanor and Sinclair, and dive a few miles away to Rapture's technological centre. Hello, Mr. Sigma? Can you hear me? The name's Porter. Charles Milton Porter. Doc Tenenbaum tells me you're here to help us get the thinker out of Rapture. It's not going to be easy, but nothing worth doing ever is. We're not playing as Delta anymore. We're playing as a different big daddy, Sigma. Our voice in the ear is a super genius by the name of Charles Milton Porter. After the death of his wife Pearl, he came to Rapture, inventing a supercomputer that could process all of Rapture's automation. He calls that computer the Thinker. It controls everything, from Rapture's oxygen supply, to the phone lines, to security bots and turrets both Delta and Jack had to battle. Porter has teamed up with our old friend Tenenbaum to get the Thinker out of Rapture, out to the surface, where they hope it can calculate a cure for splicing madness. And that's the whole plot. Nice and simple, right? No deep themes to analyse, no emotional weight to mull over, no gut-punching 
ending that makes you tear up nice and breezy. Excuse me. Minerva's Den wasn't led by Jordan Thomas, who by this point had joined the Bioshock Infinite team as a senior writer. Instead, it was Steve Gaynor of Gone Home fame who got to stretch his creative muscles. Hello there. Welcome to Minerva's Den, the home of Rapture's high technology. In two hours, Minerva's Den is almost everything I wish Bioshock 2 was in its respective 10. It's Bioshock without the shite. The level design returns to the strength of Bioshock 1, with two hubs leading off to branches of Rapture's centre, showing different parts of how Rapture achieved its technological ingenuity. I would go so far as to say that it employs Metroidvania mechanics in its structure. You find a hack tool in one of the wings that's both useful in sabotaging cameras and turrets, but also unlocks the robotics wing. You get your hands on the gravity plasmid, which then opens up operations. Your exploration is rewarded not just by audio logs, but the sheer joy of understanding where you can go next once you find the relevant tool. It's really great stuff. And speaking of the Gravity Plasmid, where the hell was this festival of laughs in the main game? They're not just a simple red keycard that buckles certain doors, using it requires a little bit of skill, tossing it through gaps in the ceiling or windows so that it can break open gravitational locks. In combat, it bandies baddies around like a band of buckaroos. Even notorious brutes get thrashed around by the ragdoll physics. It feels equally powerful and leaves you at a disadvantage because the movements are so erratic that it can throw off your aim. Give whoever invented this a bloody raise. On the whole, the puzzles are much stronger too. Again, Bioshock hardly offers up true brain teasers this is hardly the Outer Wilds, but you are required to think more. There's a section later in an office when you need to listen to an audio log that teases the solution to a passcode. You need to figure out the placement of some books in a cabinet and piece together the numbers. It might be the first time ever in a Bioshock game where I had to use my brain to progress. The new weapon, the Iron Laser, even comes with alternative ammunition. Laser cells are your standard beams that do continuous damage if you can keep your aim straight. Thermal cells add the benefit of setting your enemies on fire, and burst cells explode on impact like a grenade launcher. Just like with all of Bioshock's weapons, the gunplay isn't going to win any awards, it simply feels too smooth, missing a necessary rigidness and crackle in the sound design that would give us some oomph, but this is a substantial addition to our arsenal that makes Sigma feel pretty different from Delta. And then there's Reed Wall, our villain, the practical engineer to Porter's idealistic mathematician. Reed Wall was the co-founder of Minerva's Den. He co-invented the Thinker and wants to stop us from taking it away from him. During Rapture's economic crisis, he planned to use the Thinker to predict the outcome of ball games for gambling and stock prices for profit. But after splicing up, his focus shifted from money and power to foretelling the future. He's under the delusion that there's a predictive equation, capable of predicting everything, even our actions, and the thinker is on the verge of discovering it. We love a bit of determinism here, but I'm saving any breakdown of that philosophy for when we discuss Bioshock Infinite, so hit that subscribe button for when that video comes out. <laughs> Returning to Bioshock 2's examination of the self, Minerva's Den takes a deeper science fiction route. When designing the thinker, Porter tried to train the computer to replicate the personality of his dead wife Pearl. In a government compound, building a computer to crack the Enigma machine. Pearl got pretty fed up with me. I didn't pay her heed. And then one night, I'm out in that complex, and the blitz starts falling. He was a man in grieving and poured that grief into his work. He struggled to move on from the death of Pearl, even below the sea, and while Reed Wall's control of the thinker is the driving force of the narrative, the true story is in Porter and Pearl's relationship. Two people absolutely devoted to each other, driven apart by war and tragedy. The floors and walls might be covered in cold equations, the environments might be clinical and metallic, but the heart that beats at the centre of Minerva's den is very human even if it's a broken one. What is the thinker's self? It's a machine that has wants and desires outside of its creator. It wants to learn more about Pearl. It requests Porter continue his experiments. To what end, we never learn, but Minerva's Den gives us a computer system that has agency. Similar to Eleanor, it's been fed personalities, experiences, memories that make up the way it sees the world, and is able to replicate them so effectively that it chills Porter to the bone. But replicate is the key word here. 
While the thinker has agency, it's insinuated that this agency comes from the personalities it's fed. It relies on the shared consciousness of Porter and Pearl, and because Pearl's memories are full of devotion and care for her husband, the thinker absorbs that same devotion and care. It wants to be the best possible replica of Porter's dead wife, because it wants to make him happy just as she did. Pearl, I... No. No, this isn't right. It isn't her. Thinker, stop the test. But what's the matter, Milton? Don't you still love me? Oh god, I, Oh god, I said... I said, end function, thinker. Now! The DLC ends with a solid little twist, revealing to us that the Charles Milton Porter speaking in our ear this whole time is in fact the thinker, having successfully adopted his personality and vocal patterns. The real Porter is stuck inside the Sigma suit, having given up his self to become stronger, more powerful, a big daddy. We've been playing as him the whole time, ushered on by an identity copied from him. And this raises a question. During the events of Minerva's Den, who is the true porter? Sigma or the Thinker? Sigma isn't able to think for himself. He and we follow orders blindly because that's how he's been programmed. There's very little porter left inside the suit, but the Thinker is an exact copy, having absorbed the personalities of not just Charles, but Pearl as well. The story ends with a beautiful, contemplative walk through Porter's office. It's long, just long enough to really absorb the tragedy we've been witness to. There's rumour that 2K execs really wanted Porter's office to be the setting of a Final Combat arena, and I am so glad Irrational trusted in their vision enough to just let us take it all in. We successfully download the Thinker and reunite with Tenenbaum. Escaping to the surface, she's able to use the Thinker to find a cure for splicing, and Porter regains his sense of self again. No longer a tin can monster, no longer living in denial of his grief. And I think I'm finally ready to let you go your way. Anyway, um, let's finish Bioshock 2. At first glance, I find Persephone to be an odd name to give Rapture's prison, but as I record this, I think I've completely changed my mind. Goddess of the Underworld, Wife of Hades, Bringer of Spring, all of these are true of her, but she also stands as the symbol of one of Earth's earliest organised cults. The Eleusian Mysteries were initiations held every year by the cult of Demeter and Persephone. They are the most famous of the secret religious rites of ancient Greece, and yet still to this day, very little is known about what those initiations entailed. Martin Nilsson of the Columbia University Press wrote, the purpose of the mysteries was to elevate man above the human sphere and into the divine. This initiation would assure his redemption by making him a god and earning immortality. Considering that Persephone's most famous prisoner was Sophia Lam, it's pretty cool thematically that we can link this goddess back to a cult that tried to do exactly what Sophia is doing to Eleanor. She's trying to elevate her daughter above the human sphere. During her time in Persephone, Lam essentially took over. The chief nut was running the madhouse as she used her psychologist superpowers to convince the warden to let her run psychiatry workshops from within the prison. We can even trace direct brainwashing back to this with screens and gurneys, yet I'm still a little unsure about who was brainwashing who. Was it Andrew Ryan trying to convince political activists to join his cult of objectivism, or Lam trying to convince objectivists to join her cult of collectivism? Our first exposure to Persephone doesn't last long at all. Both Eleanor and Sophia Lam are headquartered here. We find Eleanor all grown up, locked in a cage, under hypnosis that only our presence can wake her from. And before we can rescue her, Sophia Lam enters from out of the darkness. Look at her, Delta. Ten years. And still she dreams of you. 50 seconds remaining. Do you know why Eleanor brought you here? She wanted a father. So she found a way to restore you in body and mind. Good villain entrance. Lamb's villain monologue is presented in a similar way to Andrew Ryan's Would You Kindly speech in Bioshock 1. Both locked behind bulletproof glass, both accompanied with flashbacks that contextualise our journey up until now, crystallising our relationship with Eleanor. It's been said that Bioshock 2's grand reveal isn't as powerful as Bioshock 1's, and I disagree. It's not as shocking, but it is as powerful. The twist here isn't that Eleanor brought us back to life like the flashbacks try to tell us. The flashbacks are arguably in the wrong place. The twist is that Sophia Lamb has not created a utopian. We have, and we've shaped her in our own image. 
Where Bioshock 1's twist is predicated on the fact that our choices don't matter, Bioshock 2's twist is predicated on the fact that they do. The consequence of these choices is that we have shaped our own version of Eleanor. There are a million holes in Lamb's experiment. The fact that it was undertaken in Rapture is just one of them. The reason why Lamb felt so threatened by us wasn't because we're a tin can with a drill in our arm, it's because of our link with Eleanor. In the world of Bioshock 2, the collective unconscious, Young's assertion that nobody is ever truly individual is correct, because Eleanor's personality, her outlook, whether or not she will be a selfless or selfish utopian, is entirely the result of us sharing our experiences with her. Our choices of whether or not to harvest little sisters, our sparing or murder of Lamb's lieutenants, has invisibly been building in some carefully programmed algorithm to create my Eleanor. Not yours, maybe, but mine. Through being Delta's self, the player has influenced the collective that makes up Eleanor Lamb. But there is one detail of your mutual bond she failed to account for. Your body was designed to lapse into a coma when her heart ceases to beat. Eleanor, forgive me. And because of that link, Lamb officially sacrifices her ideals. Andrew Ryan characterised his hypocrisy by sacrificing our individuality when he ordered us to kill him. This was something that was majorly important to him. Lamb's hypocrisy is characterised when she sacrifices the cause, Eleanor, for her own selfish ends, revenge against us for breaking her experiment. However, I think this twist is not powerful if you followed a strictly pacifist route. In this playthrough, Lam is barely concealing her rage because my murder of her lieutenants and my harvesting of some little sisters has transformed Eleanor into a selfish monster. But if you're playing selflessly, if you spare everyone you come across, then you are on track for the good ending. Your Eleanor will build from those experiences and become the selfless utopian that Lam wants her to be, right? So, why would Lamb smother Eleanor if we've just helped her experiment? I know this feels a bit strange, Father, but now you can see through her eyes and tell her where to go. This is how I brought you back without Mother catching on. Now, first, let's get you out of here. Eleanor survives the smothering attempt. Lamb runs off deeper into Persephone, and the game tosses us a curveball when it makes us play as a little sister. I've been sitting on this one for a while, but it means I can finally talk about how Little Sisters are utilised, so let's get into it. Okay, so you could argue that this is the point, but saving Little Sisters is an absolute ball ache in this game. Harvesting a sister is quick and painless, well, at least for the player. One tap of a button and you'll magically snap your fingers and turn them into a slug brimming with all that juicy atom. If you want to save one, you need to scoop her up on your shoulder, hunt for very specific corpses to take Adam from, defend her from an assault of splicers, rinse and repeat all of this a second time, then seek out a vent to cure her. Do you remember the worst part of Bioshock 1? Fancy doing it eight more times? I've got a whole range of complicated feelings about this system, so stick with me while I work through them. For a start, I do think the idea is sound. I appreciate that playing as a big daddy means there should be a mechanical escort mission involved where you work with a little sister. After all, that is literally all big daddies do. But there's some fine tuning needed to make this any fun to play. For example, I think any two corpses should be harvested uh, Bull. Is that a word? The fact you need to drunkenly wander around rooms you've already fought through to find one specific splicer is tedious. It's legwork rather than intriguing. Just let us grab a couple of the corpses we've already fought. The second is that this escort mission should be limited to just one corpse, and the atom for that corpse should be doubled. It would make the whole thing quicker even if still painful. The third is that harvesting little sisters needs to be disincentivized mechanically, not just in the narrative. The Eleanor reveal is still fantastic, but in gameplay, harvesting is simply too easy. For every four sisters that you interact with, a big sister will arrive and kick you about like a football. I think that this should only happen if you harvest them. That way you'd have a reason to avoid it. <laughs> 
Playing as a little sister is where we get to see Irrational's attention to detail up close and personal, but outside of this segment, there's still a whole wealth of contextual dialogue that's been programmed when you have them on your shoulder. They'll giggle if a splicer runs into a cyclone trap, they'll admire the dancing of enemies if you electrocute them. It's a tiny touch, but it adds a lot to our relationship with them and our relationship with Eleanor by extension. During this sequence, we get to see how golden and clean the little sisters see the world. In the original game, we were led to believe sisters understood the carnage that had engulfed Rapture and, psychotically, enjoyed it. Bioshock 2 shows us that that's simply not the case. They see blood as rose petals, the burning embers of campfires formed by splicers as glorious warm fireplaces. The splicers who are out for blood stand around like guests at a party. But our choices are reflected here as well in the types of statues that we see, heralding Delta's actions across the game. For example, if you murdered Alex the Great, the sculpture shows Delta wrestling a great, terrifying snake. Even outside of this section, flashing back to when we spared Grace Holloway, she sees the error of her ways and helps us escape Popper's drop. Security bots join our fight, controlled by her, gunning down any splicers in our path. Later, in Siren Alley, she sends us a care package of resources so we can restock following a combat-heavy level. The way the game considers our choices is all incredibly impressive, like a concerted effort was made to reflect them back at us in gameplay rather than by bolting a different ending onto the credits. But that's not even the most impressive part. So this, what I'm about to do, is perfectly natural. That is much better. Ready now. No matter what happens, Eleanor has now turned herself into a big sister, and she can join us in our fight through Persephone. But if you've saddled yourself with the selfish version, then your Eleanor is... Well, I'm looking at my notes here, and all I've written is a lot. She'll sacrifice the little sister who brings her the suit components, as opposed to saving her like we have. Her combat dialogue has changed, either referencing herself as a protector, or seeing Rapturians as prey to hunt down and gut. She laughs maniacally, screaming for more, give me more, as she fights alongside you, and as it slowly dawns on you that you've created a selfish god, it's enough to chill any player to the bone. She's not Lamb's messiah anymore, she's a very naughty girl. Together, Delta and Eleanor decide they're going to try and leave Rapture behind once and for all. Sophia Lamb be damned. But Lamb's last resort is to take Augustus Sinclair and turn him into a big daddy just like us. It's a really harrowing end for a guy who never stopped being a friendly voice in our ear, despite the cruelty he helped ripen in the city, and it's hard not to feel awful as he begs you to kill him before he succumbs to Lamb's control entirely. This small sequence is some of the best stuff the game offers up. It's where that clever puzzle with a few variations appears, and we're given plenty of time to prepare for a fight to the death. I didn't want to directly hurt Sinclair, so I just littered the place with traps and bombs in the hope he'd off himself, but the guy has so much health that I had to put old Yeller down in the end. Rest in peace, you bastard. If I'm being honest, Persephone goes from strength to strength as a conclusion to Bioshock's tale. The ability to summon Eleanor is a game changer, so arenas can be more restrictive and challenging without artificially upping the health of splicers. Alpha Big Daddies become an integral part of any combat strategy because you need to maneuver around them so they can become a part-time ally. In order to escape for good, Eleanor needs to gather the remaining little sisters and use them to boil away the water that's holding the biosphere in the city, meaning when all is said and done, Rapture's story ends with the little sisters. Again, the entirety of Persephone is a chapel built to honour our choices. Eleanor will either harvest the power of the sisters and boil the water herself, or recruit them for a poignant moment where they all work together. To force consciousness on such a being is to tear its wings away. That was your gift to her, Delta. Just as she hoped. You must be very proud. So, with the end in sight, it's long overdue that we address collectivism directly. There's a train of thought by Ken Wilber called the Integral Theory, where he breaks down two collectivist subcategories. Egalitarian collectivism, we should all be winners of our group, not just one person. Troy will expand his blanket fort into the space, everyone wins! Except Abed, but you know, not everyone can win. And hierarchical collectivism. I should represent the group. Where fascism enters the fray is with that second one, hierarchical collectivism. 
Stalin would be a hierarchical collectivist. Jim Jones would be a hierarchical collectivist. Sophia Lamb would be a hierarchical collectivist. The group give up their individuality in the name of the cause. They don't think for themselves. They rely on a figurehead to think for them. We can subcategorize it all we like, and I do like to do that, but all collectivism is when you boil it down is when you prioritize the group over the individual. What that prioritization means in real terms can kind of be anything. For example, we can prioritize the moral outlook of the group. If everyone says murder is morally right, and you say murder is morally wrong, collectivism would argue that murder is the way to go. Where socialism comes into it is when we start talking about wealth and resource equality. For example, over half a million Americans go homeless every year, so why should Elon Musk hoard enough money to house all of them and then some? You might have spent a good chunk of this video wondering why I concentrated so much on cults, particularly the People's Temple, rather than dissecting what Bioshock 2 says about socialism, but that's simply because I don't think Bioshock 2 really cares about socialism, not in the same way it cares about objectivism. It's much more interested in how cults work, and cults always rely on the collective. And then, Father, the rapture dream was over. You taught me that innocence is chrysalis, a phase designed to end. Only when we are free from it do we know ourselves. Bioshock 2's closing moments don't build up to a stilted boss fight like its predecessor. The game doesn't buckle and then end, it slows down, becomes contemplative. Lamb, realising she can't stop you any longer, floods Rapture in its entirety. One last ditch attempt to cleanse the city of herself, of us, of Eleanor, and any remnants of Andrew Ryan. Depending on your choices, Eleanor will either spare Sophia Lamb or kill her. She'll either kill Delta and harvest his memories, or set off on a new adventure together. No matter what ending you get, they all seem well matched. For a series all about extremes, about following philosophies to their ultimate conclusion, it's apt that Eleanor embodies that in her extremist selfishness or selflessness. But I like the sad ending the best, and here's why. The sad ending, I think, gives us more of a glimmer of Eleanor's individuality, breaking through the collective stored up inside of her. Pushing past the shared memories, the shared experiences, there's a moment where she realises that in order to retain her individuality among the whirling storm of the collective, that she needs to sever all ties with us, and the only way to do that is through Delta's death. At release, Bioshock 2 was criticised for doing more of the same, despite a metric crap ton of gameplay improvements, but in the years since, it's garnered a whole heap of praise by fans that I think are kind of overcompensating for its underdog status. They'll say that as a package, it's the best of the franchise, and while it is still one hell of a game that I think everyone should experience, my memories of it will always be coloured by how barren Dionysus Park was, or the fact Simon Wales was a post-it note to a story he should have chewed into. Of course, Bioshock 1's final two levels had arguably way more problems than that. 2's highs might never be as high as the games that sit either side of it, but its lows are never as low. And that part I think I can get on board with. Or maybe I've just drunk the Kool-Aid. Thanks for watching, and massive shout out to Kinkiki Play 2, Gaming University, and Zolti Boy for lending their voices. I've partnered with Gaming University for a fireside chat where we discuss a game that's close to both of our hearts, uh, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, so check out his channel for when that comes out. Thanks again to bestgameprice.net, links below if you want to start saving money on PC games, and as for the names on the left hand side of the screen, they're my own personal collective, my patrons, so order fags go to Trevor Vernon, Mark Anderson, Kay Dansky, Joel Wilcox, Pleo, Gavastrion, No Name, Gin Rummy, Biased Ballas, Unholy Biscuit, Uzair, Leon, Matthew Sinclair Thompson, Justin Johnson, X Wrights, Baxman, Shamax, Tibby Golanu, Aiden, Jonathan Riggs, Zachary Johnson, Daxter TK421, DNSEH, Martin Gribben, Jordan S, Jared Trainum, Nick, Damp Gibbon, Mona Carey, Kieran Gresty, Jade Kavanagh, Lamar825, Jeremy Shore, Ike N, The All Brand Man, Jake, Tempe, Courtney Wampler, Anthony Holder, David J. Morin, Minato, Iskerton, Cal Marmitage, Christopher Tierney, Torstein Sundis, Fipsy, Derek DeRosia, Luca, Tom Inns, Heliquin, Sammy Stuff, Jagke, Jordan, Alberto Calles, Lee, Austin Long, Type Raz, Matthew Bendel, Dini, Zachary Powers, Andrew Winos, Compulsory Fungus, Dank Hank, 
Prospero, Now in Guterres Nopoff, Lizzie Gale, Alan Black, Call Sign Noor, David Bedard, Dara Gate, CC, Jared Helfer, Mukor, John Foster Ag, Robert Capel, Matt McCulloch, Graham Barreros Ferreira, Ethan, Paul W, Chief Sweep, Ihor May, Jonathan Lum, Eddie Wingfors, Reese, Strupp, Angry Optimist, Yana Grasfrau, Laura Possum, Long Cheddar, Jordan Halsey, Amory Selden, Talkster, Donis Conva, Ashley Broning, 100 Sams, My Friend Neil, Michael Diaz, Nathaniel Waters, Dinkin Pearson, Kyle Piers, Seb Scott, Lonely Ronan, Chris Bread, Kane Highwind, Neve Care, and Johnny Miller. Thank you again so much for all of your support and take care. Slice of vampire.